first, I just want to say, um, wasn't it an awesome time last night for those of you who went to uh, the s'mores night? That was wonderful. We had a great time. I think about uh, most of you went. Uh, we had about 30 people there. But anyway, um, I want to thank you for, for showing up last night, and we had a great time. All right, so I have really more of a, a reminder than an announcement. Uh, so last Wednesday, uh, you were given a homework assignment just wanted to remind you that that homework assignment was to read 1st John chapter 3 in its entirety. 1st John chapter 3. Um, and I really want you to pay close attention to verses 10 and 11. Um, verse 10 and 11. And this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. That's verse 10. Verse 11, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I want you to concentrate on those two passages. Please read the entire chapter. The whole chapter will convict you. Uh, but pray first, read the entire chapter, and let the Spirit talk to you. Let the Spirit minister, minister to you. What we want to convey as much as possible is that this is a church of service. It's more than just being fed the word of God and hearing it. It becomes absolutely useless if we don't practice it, if we don't put it into practice. Jesus himself said that by this all will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And that love is an expression. It's the service that we provide to one another to demonstrate that Christ lives in us. So that's your homework assignment. I encourage you, um, please uh, study it carefully. First John chapter three, and uh, perhaps, Pastor, we can set some time aside where we can get together again and, and talk about what the Spirit has conveyed to us, what we've learned. Amen? Amen. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I have, uh, Two announcements that uh, are actually related to the homework assignment in an interesting way. Wanted to make everybody aware of the fact that next Sunday, uh, next Sunday is our communion Sunday. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to follow up communion by doing a few water baptisms. Uh, <clears throat> we've got a baptismal out here in the shed, so we're going to wheel it on out. Fill it up, heat it up. Who knows, it may need to be heated up by next week. We don't know what the weather is supposed to be, but uh, rain or shine, well, maybe not rain. <laughs> we might have to do a rain date if it's raining too hard, but, uh, but cool or hot, let's put it that way, uh, we're gonna do some baptisms next week. And uh, there's at least two or three people that I know of who need to be water baptized. So that's the plan. So what we're gonna do is immediately following the teaching and communion, we'll close the service out in prayer and then we'll head on outside and watch a few folks express their commitment to the Lord by obeying the Lord's command to be water baptized. Um, for anyone who may not know about water baptism, if you're a believer and you haven't been water baptized, there is a uh, little pamphlet, little sheet looking thing out there in the foyer about water baptism why we water baptized. I would encourage you, if you are not familiar with water baptism as a Christian, to grab a copy of that and just read through it. Next week I'll be uh, talking about water baptism prior to taking everybody outside to let them die in Christ so, they, so that they can live, which is what water baptism symbolizes. So it's gonna be a good time. <clears throat> Alrighty? Let's uh, turn our attention once again to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. Last week we ended at uh, verse 14. Verse 14 is sort of like a trumpet blast calling believers to arouse from any spiritual slumber so that Christ can shine his glorious light upon them. <clears throat> I 
we saw last week in verse 11, picking up right there just real quick. <clears throat> Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's where we left off last week. Uh, we're, let's go ahead and turn to God right now in prayer, and uh, <clears throat> then we'll move on to the next section. But let's just ask the Lord to uh, allow his light to shine on us, allow him to awaken our hearts if they need to be awakened, and let's uh, <clears throat> pray for God to speak to us today through his word. He wants to. He wants to meet us here. I asked my son David last night, I said, are you ready to meet Jesus tomorrow? And of course, when someone asks you that question, you don't know if they're getting ready to shoot you or, uh, <coughs> or whatever the case may be. But the, the truth of the matter is we, we come here to experience the Lord as his word is proclaimed and as we read together and hear God's word taught together. So let's go to him right now and ask him to bless our time. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we wanna, first of all, I just wanna th thank you for allowing us to have a very lively time of praise and worship. We thank you, God, <clears throat> that we can sing songs of praise to you that express not only good theology, but we get to express our hearts and thanksgiving, praising you for all the great things that you've done and praising you for all of your various attributes, praising you for the redemptive work in our hearts. Just singing that song, that chorus, you have saved us. Lord, I love uttering those words from my lips. Thank you, God, for saving us. Lord, thank you for the growth that you are seeking in our lives. You're desiring that we bear fruit. And you're going to come to our fruit tree and you're going to prune and water and fertilize and you're going to do whatever is necessary so that our tree will bear fruit fruit that will please you and bring honor to your name and adorn the doctrine of grace. And so, Lord, we come to you right now desiring to bear that fruit that you desire for us to bear. And we pray, God, that you would speak to us through your word. And indeed, Lord, that you would awaken our hearts and allow us, God, the privilege of growing closer to you Lord, please help us right now to cast our care upon you. As, as our minds already begin to wander, as some minds already begin to go into sleep mode, as we're fighting to just pay attention or stay awake. Lord, we all know what that battle is like. Satan desires to put a slumber over us, making us like the disciples that you told to pray in the garden and they fell asleep. Lord, awaken our hearts and make us alive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We all know what that's like, right? <clears throat> when uh, we're sitting in a meeting <clears throat> and the eyes begin to get heavy, thankfully we didn't have a big breakfast before our teaching time today, otherwise, you know, as the Sausage and the eggs start to start to take their toll and all that sugar that we ate, you know, with all the orange juice we drank or something like that. It's amazing how the enemy likes to put us to sleep and uh, or just the thoughts, cares. It's Sunday, you know, tomorrow's work for, for us. We gotta go to work, drive to work, whatever the case may be and the mind is already in planning mode about tomorrow. What do I gotta get done before 
before I have to leave for work tomorrow? What do I have to get done tonight to prepare for the following week? It's just all these, all these things. Just, it's hard just to lay it aside and just to let God speak. Last, uh, <clears throat> last week, Monday through Wednesday, I had the opportunity to get together with a bunch of uh, pastors from Virginia. We were over at Smith Mountain Lake, beautiful, great scenery, lovely place to be, perfect weather. You know, it was like this the whole time we were there. And, uh, but you know, even there, we wanna, the enemy just wants to distract in any way he can. And it was just a beautiful time of just hanging out with my bros and praying together and listening to teaching and worshiping together. But there's, there's so many things that we bring in even from the world. You know, we've got those gadgets attached to us and we're always looking at them and, and texting when we're supposed to be listening and just all that stuff. So, you know what, don't text during church. Just turn it off. You don't need to text. Nothing's that important that you need to text during church. Turn that thing off, really. So, you can't be, so you're not distracted. For your own good, turn it off. You can text when, when things are over. It's, it's not that hard, but... It, it's easy to be distracted, isn't it? <clears throat> well, look at what we're getting ready to read. So we're now we're going to pick it up, move on to the next section, verse 15. We're going to read 15 through 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then... Do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let's stop there. Back to verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. So in response to the call of awakening from sleep, we are told in verse 15 to be careful. Now, the King James Version says, <clears throat> uses a different word than careful. It says to walk circumspectly. The Greek word for careful or circumspect, circumspectly means characterized by exactness and thoroughness. Here the apostle uses this word to set before us the vast contrast between walking foolishly versus walking wisely. Now, I want to read to you a quote. I think this is very fitting at this point, <clears throat> talking about this contrast between foolishness and wisdom. Listen to this. The word fool commonly refers to a person who acts unintelligently and irresponsibly. But scripture defines a fool as a person who says in his heart there is no God and who is morally corrupt doing abominable deeds. You can read that in Psalm 14.1. The fool is the person who lives apart from God either as a theological or practical atheist or as both. Denying God by his actions as well as his words. The supreme fool is the person who has anti-God thinking and living patterns. Because men are born separated from God and with hearts that are naturally against him, they are born spiritually foolish. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man has the most important things in life exactly reversed. Consequently, he thinks foolishness is wisdom and wisdom is foolishness. No man can live without a God of some sort and the spiritual fool inevitably substitutes a false God for the true God. He creates gods of his own making and in effect, becomes his own God, his own authority in all things. As Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And therefore he determines right and wrong and truth and falsehood entirely by his own 
fallen thinking and sinful inclination. The spiritually self-sufficient fool makes his own rules and justifies his own behavior. And in doing so, he refuses to acknowledge sin and its consequences. Therefore, the ultimate destiny of fools is that they are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, and they die for lack of understanding, even while accumulating great amounts of information. They become smarter and more foolish at the same time. The natural, unregenerate man suffer, suffers from his congenital and terminal foolishness because he will not submit to God. He accumulates vast knowledge apart from God, but spiritual understanding and divine wisdom elude him. He hates the truth <clears throat> about sin and salvation. But the Bible teaches that true wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord and continues by acknowledging his truth in his ways. Ecclesiastes 9.1 says, Righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. The way to wisdom and the way to life is the way of God. The only power that can overcome a man's foolishness and turn him to wisdom is salvation. Turning to God through Jesus Christ. Turning from foolishness to wisdom is turning from self to God. And it is God's own word that is able to give us the wisdom that leads us to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So foolishness versus wisdom is our central focus at the moment. And that's why, going back to our text, <clears throat> verse 15 says to be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Now when, call, when Paul here says, be careful, he is in effect saying, <clears throat> do not live randomly. Don't just take life as it comes or follow the bend of spontaneous impulses. The inference then is clear that we should act and speak not by impulse, but according to a set of guidelines, according to rule, circumspectly, having plain fixed rules to guide us. And this contrast sharply with the state of <clears throat> believers who may be sleeping. As believers walk through the spiritual minefield of the world, they are to be constantly alert to every danger that Satan puts in their way. And this is why Jesus warned that the gate is narrow, that it's small, and the way is narrow that leads to eternal life. Verse 15 actually sounds like it's straight out of the Old Testament wisdom literature like the book of Proverbs. Throughout the early chapters of Proverbs, the writer speaks of walking in the wise path and the wise way and of not going into the way of the wicked or straying into the company of evil people. You'll find that speckled throughout, especially the first eight chapters chapters of Proverbs. Similarly, even the first psalm speaks of the blessed man as the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit, sit excuse me, in the seat of scoffers. So we're told here to be careful how we walk, being wise, not unwise. And then verse 16, <clears throat> look at that again making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, the King James words this a little bit differently. Instead of saying making the most, it says redeeming the time. And I think that the uh, King James Version captures the meaning of the original more accurately than even the NASB does. But the phrase, whether it's making the most or the word redeeming, what it means is, and I quote, to buy up for oneself or one's advantage. 
Continuing to quote, metaphorically, it means to make a wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good so that zeal and well-doing are, as it were, the purchase money by which we make the time our own. In other words, it's as if time is something we seize. Now, what's interesting is that in verse 16, the apostle here does not use the word, the Greek word chronos, which is the term that's used for clock time, the continuous time that's measured in hours, in minutes, and in seconds. Rather, he uses the word, a word, the Greek word, which denotes a measured, allocated, fixed season or period of time. God has set boundaries to our lives. And our opportunity for service exists only within those boundaries. It's significant that the Bible speaks of such times being shortened, but never of their being lengthened. A person may die or lose an opportunity before the end of that prescribed time. But he has no reason to expect his life or his opportunity to continue after the end of his predetermined time. And so having sovereignly bounded our lives with eternity, God knows both the beginning and the end of our time on earth. Thus, time is a gift from God. It's something that we have already been given by God. When man is born into the world, he's born into time. Time exists and it's here with us or without us. And we do not have a single thing that we can do. There's not a single thing that we can do to get more of it. We have the time that we have. And so what we have to do is we have to use our time wisely. We have to use it to do the best that we can. And so the walk of wisdom calls us to buy up the opportunities that time affords. Every day brings its open doors, its vast potential. Every day there's just so much time that we have. We don't know how much time that is. <clears throat> don't we assume every day that we're going to have all the time we need that we want? Honestly, do we spend every day thinking about the fact that I could die by day's end? I would say most of the time we do not, if we're honest. But redeeming the time means living lives that are noted for doing the will of God, seeking holiness, doing deeds of mercy, word, speaking words of help, loving God, etc., etc. When we walk obediently in the narrow way of the gospel, then we're walking carefully. Then we're making the most of our time then we're taking full advantage of every opportunity to serve God. Then we're redeeming our time to use for His glory. Then we're taking every opportunity to shun sin and to follow righteousness. Paul the Apostle in Galatians 6.10 said, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men and especially to those <clears throat> excuse me, who are of the household of faith. Now, for God's, for his own reasons, God allows some of his children to live and to serve far into old age. Others he grants only a few years or even a few weeks. We're, we always marvel when, we, when, when someone dies at a young age, especially someone who's on fire for the Lord and they they pass away in their 
20s or the 30s and we say he died before his time, you know. Why would God take him so young? I used, <clears throat> I used to wonder that about Keith Green years ago when the Lord took him. Very young, 29 I believe. That's pretty young. But none of us knows how long or how short his own allocation of time will be. Now here in verse 16, what lends special urgency to this matter is the evil characters of the days in which we live. When Paul says that the days are evil, he is expressing the fact that God's people presently live in an age that is characterized by an abundance of evil and dominated by powerful supernatural forces. The present evil era will continue until the Messiah comes and subdues the widespread rebellion against the authority and reign of God. But in this present era, every day can potentially abound with evil. And this is one of the reasons why Paul will later implore the Ephesians to outfit themselves with the armor of God so that they will be able to face a time of intense evil and they will be able to stand firm. But it's interesting here that Paul does not advise them to passively find a safe place to wait until Christ returns. Rather, he calls us to participate with the risen Christ in a mission to fill the world with the good news of redemption and to live lives that are pleasing to God. He calls on us to devote our lives to performing good works. Thus, walking wisely means not only living with ethical purity and integrity before God, but aggressively doing good and sharing the gospel, trying to win people to Christ. The phrase in verse 16, evil days, also reminds us that God will not always strive with man. The day of grace will soon close. The opportunities for worship, to, to witness, to pray, to show diligence, to do service on earth will soon be forever ended. All the opportunities that we need to please God, to serve God, those opportunities are now. They're not tomorrow. They're now. We're commanded to live in the now. We're commanded to think about the future with God. But the future of our future on earth, we don't know if we have one. And so the Bible tells us, redeem the time now. Now, <clears throat> there are many biblical texts which stand as, a warn which stand as, as warning beacons to those who think that they will always have time to do what they should. When Noah and his family entered the ark and shut the door, when, when God shut the door, the opportunity for any other person to be saved from the flood was gone. That was it. The five foolish virgins who let their oil run out before the bridegroom came were shut out from the wedding feast. And there are many other examples that could be cited of people running out of time. To put a period on this little section and to hope, hopefully give us all a, a, a great sense of urgency to regard the short amount of time that we have, we're going to turn to two passages. First of all, we're going to go to the left to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Then we're going to go to the left from there to Psalm 90. But Stop at 1 Corinthians 7 <clears throat> before you venture over to Psalm 90 unless you want to just 
stick a finger there. First Corinthians chapter seven. <clears throat> And of course, one of the dangers of jumping into the middle of a chapter is you're not reading what's before or after the verses you're going to cover, but things sort of culminate in chapter 7, verse 29, talking about a variety of things related to marriage. But look what he says in chapter 7, verse 29. 1 Corinthians 7, 29. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened. No, it, as I said earlier, it never says it's been lengthened. Yet we're never told that, hey, don't worry about it. You got plenty of time to get everything done. This I say, brethren, the, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none those that weep as though they did not weep and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice and those who buy as though they did not possess and those who use <clears throat> this world as though they did not make full use of it for the form of this world is passing away. Now, of course, he, he's not saying there Husbands, ignore your wives. <laughs> Those who weep uh, don't weep at all. Those who rejoice don't rejoice, otherwise we wouldn't even have a praise service, right? Those who buy as though they did not possess, well, obviously we have to be stewards over what we have, right? So it's not saying just to ignore everything, but it's saying that everything you do in this life in your endeavor to please God, do realize that it all has an end to it. And we're working with that end in mind. Not that we're going to continue to exist forever in this life because we're not, right? Now, turn to Psalm 90. Go to the left to Psalm 90. <clears throat> Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses. It says at the beginning, the man of God. <clears throat> Let's look at this very quickly. Verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Establishing the fact God's eternal. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. In other words, a lifetime to God is a blink. It's just a blink. He... he Time is of, of, of no essence to God. Verse 5, you have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. For we've been consumed by your anger and by your wrath we've been dismayed. You've placed our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your presence. So the writer here is, we, we get the impression that there's, <clears throat> there's a problem between the people and their God, right? Verse nine, for all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the ends of our life, they contain 70 years or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. So there's how we can determine the basic longevity of man. The average age of man is, is basically between, I think now it's gone up a little bit, I think the average age for women is 76 and for men 72. Something like that. Don't, don't quote me on that, but it, it's close to that. So if we live to be 70, well, you know, that's, 
that's what's basically expected. And if by reason of strength, maybe you're in better shape or whatever the case may be, you might get 80 years. I'd be happy to live 80 years. I would consider that a long life. But the idea here, continuing on in verse 11, who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? See, the idea here is getting this grasp of, of God and who he is, of what he can do, and <clears throat> understanding the, the, the finitude of man, the fact that man is finite. And that's why verse 12 says, so teach us to number our days so that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days <clears throat> that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Teach us to reckon, okay, I've only got so many days. I don't know how many days that, that is, but I know I've only got so many until I turn to dust. Continuing, verse 13, do return, O Lord, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. O satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us in the years where that we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. In other words, Lord, we want our days to count. We don't want our days to be filled with being under your judgment. <clears throat> we want our days to be fruitful. We want to reckon each one of them as if we knew how long it was going to be and we want to make every, one, every single one of those days count. Verse 17, I love this. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. In other words, I want my hands to be fruitful with the days that I have. With what God has given me, I want to redeem the time. Redeem the time. Flip on back to Ephesians. <clears throat> Life is short. Time is short. Making the most of your time. The last thing that we read, looking at verse 17 again. <clears throat> so then, in light of that, do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now the word for foolish here is actually different from the one, the word fool that's used in verse 15. Here it means without reason, senseless, foolish, stupid, without reflection or intelligence, acting rashly. That's not too good, is it? <clears throat> I don't want to be like that. The word or the term foolish appears 74 times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what we call the Septuagint. 74 times in the book of Proverbs in order to contrast the fool with the one who walks in the ways of the Lord and who follows the path of wisdom. <clears throat> For instance, Proverbs 10.23 says that a fool finds pleasure in evil conduct, but a man of understanding delights in wisdom. A few of the characteristics that Proverbs reveals about fools are, <laughs> this is a pretty long list here, it says that they are lazy, that they have uncontrolled tongues and thus lie, slander, quarrel, and are quick-tempered. They are proud, they hate knowledge, and they despise advice or correction, and they are reckless and careless. Now, much of this list corresponds with the kind of moral exhortation that Paul has been giving here in Ephesians 4 and 5. Rather than acting foolishly, Paul here advises his readers to discern the Lord's will. The word understand there goes beyond simple cognitive awareness to applied knowledge. It goes beyond that. One of my lexical sources explains that the term entails employing one's capacity for understanding and thus to arrive at insights. In other words, I understand what I need to do. Followed up by action. Yet this reasoning process is predicated on hearing from the Lord 
and giving heed to his words as revealed in scripture. And this is beautifully illustrated in the book of Proverbs. In fact, real quick, turn to Proverbs chapter two. We'll read through this quick. I know I'm running out of time. Proverbs chapter two. This is really cool. Watch, watch how this is laid out. Proverbs chapter two, verse one. It says this. My son, just imagine the Lord is speaking this to us, okay? My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, <clears throat> then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So we see here it's something that we go after. Walking wisely is walking in the will of God as revealed in his word. Now, it's important to understand that, if you can turn on back to Ephesians now, it's important to understand that uh, the strong implication of Paul's words here in verse 17 is that God's will is not a deep, dark secret which only a handful of saints will ever be able to discern. The will of God is here depicted as that which is patently clear and that anyone who fails to discern or to do it is foolish. Doing the will of God is acting wisely and with sound reasoning as guided by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. I loved Psalm 119 verse 27. It says, the psalmist said, make me understand the way of your precepts so I will meditate on your wonders. Proverbs 14.8 says, the wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way, but the foolishness of fools is deceit. In other words, the wise man wants to understand, what am I doing? Why am I here? What does God want from me? So the important thing is for people to know and to do God's will. It's not surprising that fallen men have twisted the meaning of God's will, focusing more on ourselves than upon God and upon his plan. We have a tendency to personalize the picture of the will of God which the scriptures paint for us. God's will has thereby become God's will for my life. When the Bible speaks of God's will, there are times when it speaks of his specific will for a particular person in any given situation. But that's not, that's not the norm. Much more frequently, the Bible speaks of the will of the Lord as his overall plan. In other words, the Bible gives principles and those principles have to be sought out. In the context of Ephesians, the will of God is the eternal plan of God. We saw that outlined in chapters one through three and expressed through the various commands that we're looking at in chapters four through six. If we are to be wise rather than foolish, then we are to be astute concerning the plans and purposes of God as revealed in the scripture. And we are to base our decisions on God's eternal plan. We are to subordinate our plans to the eternal plans and purposes of God. In the vast majority of instances, the will of God for our life is dictated by God's eternal plan, by the principles that we find contained in the scriptures. 
In those instances where specific divine guidance is needed, well, God will direct our path, whether by revelation from his word or providentially. But the thing that we need to keep in mind is God wants us to know the entirety of his word, the principles that are laid out in the scripture. In other words, I don't need to pray about whether or not I should hook up with that guy or gal if they're an unbeliever because the scripture already told me not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I don't have to pray about that. The principles in scripture tell me what to do. Sometimes we're always waiting for that little light to boop, you know, beam down on us. Yes, Lord. We're looking up, light shining down. And God can speak that way. But the normative way that God speaks is through his word. Second Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Psalm 119, 130 says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. If I'm a simpleton and I want to have wisdom, I read my Bible and that gives me wisdom. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, how can a man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to God's word. Consider 2 Peter 1, 2. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who is called by us, <clears throat> who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Seeing that by his divine power, he has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. For by these promises, God has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And so the, the, the principles of scripture are things that we have to seek out if we don't want to understand the will of God. But we're told here that we are to understand what the will of God is. And the will of God is something that God has preserved for us in his word. I'm always concerned when I hear believers talking about how they want to hear from God, but they don't have a consistent practice of reading the Bible. That's a, that's a bad thing. It's a really bad thing. God has spoken to us in his word and one of the things that the Lord wants to do in our lives <clears throat> is for us to be so acclimated with scripture that that's how God speaks. When Isaiah 30 says, <clears throat> speaks about, you'll hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk in it, this is the way, walk in it. The way God does that is he the Holy Spirit quickens our hearts, our minds with the words that we've filed away in our souls as we read the Bible. Because the Bible is a spiritual book. It's different than any other book. It's not like a, uh, a novel. It's a spirit-inspired book. The words are inspired by God. And the words latch onto us internally, if you will. It's my fancy theological way of looking at it. Those words adhere to us when we are filled with the Spirit of God. And that's how we understand His will. And according to the apostle here, to not know the will of God is to live in foolishness. To not know God's word is to be foolish because we're walking blindly without it. Do we understand that? I, I thought we might get through verse 20, but we're not going to be able to get through verse 20 today. I don't want to rush through 18 through 20. I think we've seen enough being careful how we walk. 
making the most of our time because the days are evil. And so in order to do, make the most of our time, we're gonna have to know what God's word says, right? It's gonna, be, it's gonna have to be something that's familiar to us. There's a recall. God's word, God's will. The, the, t- the two are, cannot be divided. God's will is, is God's word, what he's revealed to us. Again, it's not a dark, hidden secret. It's not like only the deeply initiated get it. Now, you can't expect to know God's will if you don't read it, but it doesn't even require a special education. The Holy Spirit can speak God's word to a child and reveal himself to that child. So that's where we'll stop for today. So what are we going to do with this time that we have? It could end for us at any moment. We could look at that as a threatening thing. There should be a little bit of fear involved in that. Nothing wrong with having a healthy fear of our mortality. But beyond that, there should also be just a desire to want to live lives that are pleasing to God. It's not a bondage thing. Why wouldn't I want my life to count, right? And we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, In fact, we're going to see a variety of ways. We're coming right up on it. We're going to see how we do that in in marriage. And we're going to see how we do that at, at the job. And how parents do that with their children and we're going to see very specific examples. Because serving God's very practical. It really is. Let's stand together. <coughs> it's amazing that we have all these gadgets today that are supposed to streamline our lives and make our lives less complicated. <coughs> but... The truth is, sometimes those gadgets actually complicate our lives even more. The management of those things can become very time-consuming. So we do have to evaluate what we spend time doing. We have to evaluate the minutes of the day, the hours, the days, (laughs) the weeks, because we are commanded to know the will of God and to redeem that time, that precious time. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you today for this sobering warning and yet this most encouraging warning because Lord, we know that when we are in Christ, we have lives that matter We have a will being given to us by you that matters. We're no longer searching for meaning. We have found meaning. Now we just need to get busy serving the master. So Lord, we do want to ask that you would search our hearts and show us, God, where we can make the most of our time because of the evil days in which we live. And we ask, Father, that your will for us would come alive. Father, that we would seek it out, that we would desire to know what it is so that we can walk accurately. Lord, we don't want to be as one who's fighting like they're beating the air, as the apostles said. We want our punches to count. And so, Lord, help us to walk circumspectly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If anyone needs prayer, Byron and I will be available to you to pray with you if you need prayer. God bless you guys.